Welcome back to my channel. In this video, we will continue our exploration of the hypothetical scenario of Deku becoming the Norse god Fenrir. In the first four parts of this series, we looked at the characteristics and abilities of both Deku and Fenrir, as well as how this transformation would affect the story of My Hero Academia and how Deku's journey as Fenrir. Now, in this fifth part, we will see how Deku managed to train with Gran Torino as he was the former teacher of All Might. Get ready to delve deeper into the world of My Hero Academia and Norse mythology as we continue this fascinating exploration. Thanks for tuning in and I hope you enjoy the video. Chapter 14, A Turn for the Worst The first year's sports festival winners have been concluded. And with that, it's time to relax while we have the rewards ceremony. A platform came from the ground in a cloud of smoke for added dramatic effect. On the top platform was Izuku, on the second place was Bakugo, and the third was Tokoyami. Now, because of this wonderful year of contestants, there is only one person who should award our champions. All the way on top of the stadium, All Might appeared to look over the edge. I am here. The crowd went wild when a great symbol of peace entered the stadium with a mighty leap down to the podiums. He stood proud for a second to allow the cameraman to get some good shots before taking the medals from midnight. Congratulations, young Tokoyami. You showed excellent power in the events. However, you must learn to expand your skills. You cannot expect to win every fight with your quirk alone. Thank you, sir. The two pulled into a hug before All Might went to Bakugo. Young Bakugo. You have talent and skill, but that attitude needs to change if you want the people that you're protecting to accept you. Bakugo said nothing as All Might placed the medal around his neck and awkwardly hugged the boy. Then it was Izuku's turn. Midoriya. You did excellently today. Not just in independence, but also in teamwork. You will make a great hero with those traits. He placed the medal around his neck and went for the hug. When he did, he quietly talked into Izuku's ear. This is probably starting to sound old already, but I am proud. It never does. Izuku tightened the hug before the two pulled away. Here you have it, the winners of this year's sports festival. Congratulations, all of you. You prove that there is a reason that you are here. And because of everyone's hard work, there will be a two-day break. Another thing, I'm sure that there will be pro heroes who want to recruit you, so we'll look over the results when you return. Use these two days wisely, you still have a lot of training to do when you get back. Yes, sir. Oh, Izuku, my little pup. I'm so proud of you. Thanks, Mom. It's always nice to have you cheering me on. Since Izuku had two free days, he decided to visit home. The Yagi family were holding a short celebration for him getting first place in the festival. The reason for it coming to quick end was the boy had somewhere else to be. All right. I'm off. I'll see you two later tonight. Bye. Bye, dear. So long, my boy. After said boy left, Toshi looked to his wife. So, now that I'm home, what shall? Take me. He was more than obliged, but had to stop when they heard the yelling from down the street. I can still hear you. So, what was the reason for suddenly wanting to see her? After Izuku left the house, he headed out to meet Shoko in town. She had explained that she was going to visit her mother after all this time and needed some encouragement. When Endeavor saw that I used my fire in the cavalry battle, he thought that I was just going to obey him now. And that's what's got me thinking, this fire is my own, something of my own free will. If I can show mother that I'm not my father, show her what you showed me, then maybe she can come to terms with my left side. It's good that you're willing to try and I hope that she does see the kind of person you are, because you're wonderful, fire or not. Thank you, Izuku. The walk was quick when they got lost into conversation. Before they knew it, they stood in front of the building that held Shoko's mother. They got checked in from the front desk easily enough, and in no time, they looked at the door. This is it. Shoko looked and smelled nervous for obvious reasons. It is. But only can you possibly find what you're looking for is if you open that door. With enough will, Shoko twisted the handle. That last two days passed in a blur. And soon enough, they were back in Class 1A. Morning class. 
The arrival of their homeroom teacher silenced any previous conversations as they greeted him back. It's good to see that you all seem to be doing well. Good, because we have a busy day ahead of us. Code names. The class grew excited upon hearing that they were going to come up with their hero identities. Usually, you wouldn't have to do this until later on in the year. However, since this year's massive rise in heroes wanting to draft you for sidekicks, this needed to be done earlier. In case you were all wondering how many offers you got, you can see on this list. With the press of a button, the screen on the wall lit up with a list of their names and a number that signifies the amount of offers. Holy crap! The whole class was shocked to see that the wolf has gotten over 6,000 offers. Shoko was behind with over 5,000 and Bakugo with just barely 2,000. He would have gotten more if he visibly wasn't such an ass to the other contestants. The rest were fairly average. Whoa, Todoroki. You got more offers than Bakugo, even though you lost in the second round. Jiro stated her confusement before being answered by Yayorozu. She probably got more because of who she fought instead of who she lost to. Her and Izuku's fight was one of the most exhilarating of them all, so she was able to show a lot of her power and skill. The same goes for Izuku, who managed to get as many offers because he fought with control and overwhelming power. Why you don't have to go that far? Shoko was grateful but felt a little embarrassed from the attention. Besides, I guarantee that a portion of them are because of my father. Which reminds me Aizawa Sensei. Everyone's attention went to Izuku. Bakugo is here, but why is he not in the class? What do you mean he's here? Kurashima asked before their teacher could answer. His scent is coming from the room next door. There was some puzzled chatter before they were silenced from Aizawa using his quirk. Yes. Bakugo is and will be absent from this classroom here on out. Throughout the year, the teachers had noticed his odd behavior in trying to discreetly harass other students. Also, his foul attitude during the sports festival has gotten him an image of a UA student with villain intentions. And because Vlad King is better suited for students such as him, Bakugo will be moved to Class 1B. What about the open seat? Will someone be moved up from a lower class? Kaminari asked. Yes, although, that person won't be joining until after the weekend. Back on track, that is why you'll be needing to make your names now. You will be able to change them later on in life, but you will need to take these seriously because if you don't, you'll have hell to pay later. These are the names that you will be showing to the world. So be sure to not have anything indecent. Aizawa was interrupted by midnight as she came through the door. What she says is true. That is why she will be the one to approve of your names, since it's not exactly my forte. And with that, everyone got to making their names. Shoko had come up with her name while she and Izuku designed their costumes together. She walked to the front of the class and showed the name that she wanted to show the world. The element hero, Frostburn. Ikwai it was so hard for me to come up with a name for her. This was literally the best I could come up with. Oh, sounds powerful. I approve. Hmm. You can't be seriously thinking that this isn't good enough. No, no, not at all. It's just I don't think I've ever heard of a hero with the title of God in it. It fits, doesn't it? My quirk is based on a god after all. Of course. And I approve. Izuku was thrilled to hear that his lifelong hero name was going to be the one that people across the world could feel hope in Indiana. He looked back to his board to indulge. The Norse god hero, Fenrir. Turned out that Izuku wasn't the only one to have God in their hero title. Shortly after, Tokoyami came up and presented his name. It was a multi-worded name that came together to form a different word. One of those words was God, which formed into Shinto God of the Night. Oh well. Now, that's all figured out, I'll be passing out the lists of heroes that are offering you internships. Be sure to put a lot of thought into these, and I also suggest that you get working on them now. You only have another two days until your week-long experience of training under a pro hero. So, get to it. Yuwok, have any of you guys figured out what hero agency to pick? Ashido was still visibly upset about getting far in the tournament but somehow got no offers. Yeah, I did actually. Some people look surprised to hear that Yurarika had already made her choice. I'm going to the hero agency that the battle hero, Gunhead, runs. 
but I thought you were more interested in rescue. Rib bit. Tsu had heard how she admired Thirteen in their rescue work. I am, but after the tournament I realized that my combat is pretty weak. So, I need to learn to get better in all different kinds of hero work. The first sentence was said with a slight defeated look in her face as she looked to her hand, but was able to brighten up at the end. Thankfully, her hand wasn't permanently damaged and was healed up fairly easily by Recovery Girl. But still, what the blonde bastard did was unacceptable. Izuku was watching the class go on about their decided hero agencies. He was going to talk to his father about it first, since he is a hero after all. That was when his eyes landed back on Ida. He's been quiet today, way too quiet for someone like him. He remembered that Ida had told them about what happened to his brother during the festival and had to leave in a hurry. Hopefully it's nothing serious. Hey Todoroki, Midoriya, mind if I walk with you too? Yuraraka had come up to them at the end of class just before they got to the door. Actually, I was just about to part ways. I feel like I'm going to be needed in the next few seconds. Izuku gave his answer as he opened the door. I am here, in a bizarre position. All Might slid out from seemingly nowhere in a strange ball form. I can see that. Mind explaining? Izuku had a pretty good idea, but he couldn't talk about it in front of the others. Ah, yes, would you please come with me for ASEC? Shoko and Yuraraka watched as the boy followed All Might into the hall. Huh, anyway, you can still walk with me if you want. Oh, thanks Todoroki. Shoko. Yuraraka looked back to the other girl with a confused look. Call me Shoko. The brunette smiled. Then I'm Ochako. The pair nodded to each other before leaving the room together. I got another offer. Must be from someone important if you're telling me this yourself. Why yes. The hero is named Gran Torino. He taught here at UA for only a year. In fact, he was my homeroom teacher. But that's not all. He also knows about one for all. Whoa, really? This guy sounds like the real deal. H.H. he is. He worked alongside my predecessor and were good friends. It's been a while since he's retired. And my guess is, he has become interested in Y.U. after I told him that I see chose you as my successor. Are you okay? You're shaking like crazy and I've never seen you give off this much fear before. Izuku was beginning to get a little worried midway of Toshi's explanation. What did this person do to Dad? H-H-U-H. O-H, well I I tease just. Good luck. With haste, Toshi threw a piece of paper and bolted. Izuku just stood there for a few seconds, wondering if his life was in danger. He managed to focus himself before picking up the little note. Oh boy. You all have your costumes, right? Remember, you're not allowed to wear within public yet, and don't lose them. Understand? Gotcha. Ashido, mind your manners. You're trying to impress pro heroes. It's yes, sir. Mm -hmm, yes, sir. Ashido whimpered before meeting her teacher's demands. Now, go make Yue proud. Yes, sir. The whole class joined in this time. After that, everyone went their separate ways. But, Izuku was at a loss. Something about Ida was unsettling. His scent was familiar, and not in a good way. It was the same scent that a predator gave when they were on the hunt. I should go talk to him. Just before he could take the first step. Izuku, your train will leave without you. Get going. Oh, sorry, Sensei. So, this retired hero is someone who trained the number one hero. Said hero is completely terrified of him, and has even taught at UA for a year. Izuku hummed his laughter from his seat in the train that was taking him to his destination. I accept the challenge. This is disappointing. He made sure to follow the address correctly. He even followed the scent of the piece of paper. This was definitely it. He expected a somewhat fancy home, fitting of a hero who was friends with the seventh holder of OFA. But, the structure in front of him just looked sketchy. Well, I won't get anything done just by standing here. Izuku walked up the steps and to the front door. He knocked, even though he knew the person just behind the door was aware of the greenette. He heard the slight sound of breathing turn into a small snicker before the breathing became still. 
Isn't this something? Gran Torino is a jokester. He opened the door so taking the view of a small man in a hero costume laying face down on the floor. There was shattered ceramic pieces around the floor and had an unusual amount of ketchup all over him. Two can play that game. Well, isn't that a bummer? Although, I am pretty hungry. A wolf's gotta eat. Maybe just a nibble. I'm alive. Izuku burst into laughter when the frightened man jumped up with his hands out to protect himself. The elder looked confused at first before realizing that he was gullible enough to believe that a UA student was about to eat his corpse. Ha ha ha, ah. You should see the look on your face. You actually thought I was going to eat you. Yeah, yeah, joke's over, kid. Get your costume on. The demand was able to pull Azuku out of his fit and look to the elder in confusion. Wait, why? I'm testing you, right here, right now. I saw how you used one for all during the festival. I got to admit, you're honing its power better than I thought, but you're still using it incorrectly. What are you waiting for? Put it on. Izuku got to it when he realized that the man was serious now. The change was quick and easy due to the simplicity of his costume. This was the second time that it's been fully repaired since he destroyed it in his transformation at the USJ. Although, he did add some extra details. Along his ribs and shoulder, he had a set of three white metal strips that resembled claws that looked like they were wrapping around his sides and shoulders. All right, I'm ready. He barely finished the sentence before Torino blasted off. He was using every surface in the room to jump to another. He was fast. To the normal human eye, he was just a blur, but Izuku has far surpassed a normal human. In the real world, you aren't given the chance to get ready. Next time, I won't give you as long. Gran Torino was aiming for the right time to strike, but there was something wrong. The boy hasn't moved since he began. If he's that cocky, then I'll just kick some sense into him. He went for the kick. It was aimed for the left side of his head. Mastai's met forest fire. Gran Torino was shocked to have his foot be caught by a powerful wolf hand. The boy's arm was transformed and shrouded in orange and green sparks. His collar was lit up with four strange symbols. If you're telling me that I can get even stronger, then please teach me. This kid. You said that I was using one for all incorrectly. What do you mean specifically? After the short fight, the two sat down to discuss. I watched you use that power in the festival. From what I can tell, your body is fully capable of handling the backlash, even though your technique is improper. Um, okay. You've basically already said that. I can't teach you the very details of how to use it. It's different for every user. For All Might, it comes in a kind of transformation, while for Nana, it was a state. Nana? What, did that buffoon not tell you about the seventh holder? No, sir. Great. Well, if he hasn't told you about it yet, then he's probably got something planned. So, I'll leave that to him. Anyway, the power of one for all usually comes in those two forms. If you can figure out which of those two, then you're basically their kid. It also enhances the quirk of the user. Did anything change after he gave it you? Yes, actually. I'm assuming you saw that transformation I took in the last round? He was answered with a nod. It appeared after I obtained one for all, if that's what you mean. MMM, if I'm correct, it looks like a smaller version of the form you took four years ago. It is. Until then, I was unable to perfectly control that form. Somehow, it gave me complete access to the features of my quirk without restrictions. Izuka noted that Torino has seen the mall incident. That sounds about right. Tashinori was quirkless so we don't have a good example to go off of. Izuku was slightly surprised that he knew about his father being corkless before receiving OFA. Then he wasn't when he remembered that the elder taught Toshi. You seem to be very close to Dad, besides being student and mentor. Dad. W what? Didn't he tell you that he married my mom? Married. Meanwhile, all the other students were at their own internships. As well as Ida. I think it's still crazy that Ingenium's little brother is interning with me. Surly, you must have gotten offers from much more popular heroes. Yes, I did. However, 
In order for me to live up to my brother's name, it is best that I learn from all heroes. Even if it's just simple patrolling. That's not why I'm really here. To be completely honest, I don't like you. Heh. Your behavior during the festival was quite unpleasant. I know why you chose me, but just because I'm the number four hero, and I saw that you had potential, doesn't mean I'm going to encourage your ego. I have no clue what you mean. We were supposed to fight each other, and that's exactly what I did. Bakugo put on his kind smile to try and swipe away the criticism. That right there. The face that you only show in front of the people that matter. Listen here, kid. There was only one reason that I wanted you here, and it wasn't because you got second place. I wanted you here to get rid of that annoying attitude of yours. I'm going to teach you to be aware of your appearance, the way you speak, how to control your emotions. Within the span of this single week, I will stitch these into the fiber of your being. I'm surprised you took up my offer. Why would you be? I may be the number 12 hero, but most people aren't too fond of me because of my appearance. Then they're fools to judge someone based on something that can't be helped. Hmm, that's a good trait to have if you want to become a hero, kid. So, shall we get started, Manoma? It's good to see that you're finally taking the path of the mighty. I will not follow any path that you lay down for me. I will take my own. HMP, is that so? Either way, you should go get ready. We're heading out, Shoko. So, you're the ones that attack UA. And you want to recruit me? Yeah. You all know how this goes down. I guess getting old really does make you sleep more. He went straight to bed after coming back from the store. Flashback. You mean to tell me that jerk got married and didn't even invite me? Oh, I'll kick his ass the next time I see him. Yeah, I thought it was strange that I didn't see you there after learning about your relationship with him. Grr, stay here. I need to go get some sweets to calm myself. With that, the retired hero left. That was something. Flashback end. The night is still young, and I'm nocturnal for a reason. Time to try this out. The boy stealthily left the building through the front door and moved to the neighboring ally. It was full of trash bags that could cushion his exercises. Yeah, this could work. Gran Torino said that one for all comes in a transformation or a state. Since I have lots of experience in both of these, I think I have a good chance in figuring this out. For five minutes, Izuku stood completely still, but his mind was racing. He was coming with tons of different techniques of applying OFA to mimic the feeling of shifting into Fenrir. That's it. In my light form, I only have access to part of my power. But, in full form, I'm at my maximum. If I were to share this technique with OFA dash dot. Izuku pulled on the secondary source of power within him. But, unlike the past times where he only used it on a single part of his body, he cloaked himself in the feeling of raw strength. He saw the physical results as veins, that were similar to Fenrir's, spread across his entire body. Once they covered him completely, he glowed slightly as green sparks danced around him. This feels amazing. It's similar to when I first used Ragnarok's light form on the beach. That didn't take you long. Izuku spun to see Gran Torino standing at the end of the ally. He must have been too distracted with his discovery to notice him. Since you're able to use one for all's full power, you could take on Tashinori right now if you wanted to. But that's going to have to wait, because first thing in the morning, we're having a rematch. Why did he have to tease me like that? He said, first thing in the morning, dot. So why is he having me make him breakfast? Torino, sir, we will be sparring after this, right? Of course. Can't fight on an empty stomach. Yeah, I guess you're right. I'm just a little excited is all. Why is that? You managed to stop me yesterday without using one for all like you did last night. The boy stopped what he was doing and turned back to the elder. Said elder shivered at the sight of a predatory smile on the boy's face. It's not the same when your prey doesn't get serious. I know I said this already but, this kid. Gran Torino made sure to eat his pastry slowly, just to tease the greenette further. Watching the boy fidget in his chair was like watching a puppy looking for attention. It almost made him lose his cool a few times. 
The moment he swallowed the last bite, their eyes connected similarly to yesterday. Both were absolutely still, waiting for the other to make the first move. A single spark of electricity next to the wolf's shoulder, and they were gone. The previously peaceful room turned into a blurry war zone. One blur had a stream of propelled air, while the other left behind green sparks. You're already able to adjust the amount of power you put into each movement. You're adapting far faster than I expected. The voice could be heard, but not seen where it came from. My quirk and one for all work in similar ways, so it was easy to figure it out. Torino was bounding from wall to floor to ceiling. There was no way any ordinary person could keep up with him. But every time he looked back, the boy was right on him, bearing his teeth into a grin and with his claws outstretched to grab him. It worried the elder that he was still in his original form and only had three runes activated. He cursed to himself when he saw the fourth lit up and the boy vanished again. He wasn't able to see the incoming strike before it was too late. Torino hit the ground with a grunt but was able to get back up just as fast. When he did, he couldn't move. The boy was everywhere. He was moving so fast that there were afterimages of him creating a prison around him. Then they stopped. And so did Torino's breathing as the claw was merely a centimeter away from his throat. The wolf pulled away with a triumphant smile. So, does this mean I win? That damn hero killer. He thinks that he's so noble, it disgusts me. He dares to call my goals childish while he's doing the same thing. What an idiot. Tamura and Kirojiri watch as the hero killer runs farther away on the rooftops. It is simply a matter of reasons, Master Tamura. Not all agree with others and you can't force them to. I don't have to force him to do anything. After all, a dead person doesn't have reasons. Bring the Gnomus. Torino decided to bring the boy to a nearby slums. Getting the experience in fighting separate types of villains would expand his flexibility. Gran Torino, I was wondering. Since you've retired, do you often do hero work at all? I know that would go against the meaning of being retired, but from the way th. The elder in question was confused as to why the boy stopped and noticed that his ears were twitching. What do you hear, Dash? Everyone, get down. Before anyone could react, something crashed through the side of the train. Izuku could tell that it was a hero, but he was banged up. Izuku also noticed that he had a similar canine mutation, so when he saw the hand of a gnomu slam his head into the ground, he felt driven to attack. Stay back, kid. But, I can he. He couldn't say any more as Torino sent a flying kick to the gnomu's jaw, then tackled it out of the hole it came. Izuku went to the down hero to check on him. When he did, he got a good look of what was happening on the outside. In the distance, everything was on fire. He could hear the screams and smell the smoke. I'd be damned if I don't go. You will remember my name for as long as you live. It is the name of the hero that I was proud to call my brother. So, fight me. I am the hero, Ingenium. A blade was raised. Izuku activated four runes as he shifted into light form. There was no way he was just going to stand by and let a creature that looks like the Nomu from USJ attack these people. He leapt out of the train and over several buildings. The moment he landed, he jumped again. He couldn't afford to waste time in a situation like this. It only took a few more leaps before he was in small open area with several heroes and two more Nomus. One was massive, even bigger than the one Toshi fought. The other was smaller and had wings that it was using to fly. This is bad. This is terrible. If these things are just as strong as the ones from USJ, then everyone here is in danger. I have to help them. Get out of here, kid. It's not safe. From his right, a woman jumped in front of him to shield him from the danger when it needed to be the opposite. Do I have your permission? The hero that tried to get him to leave turned with a dumbfounded look. I have a license that allows me to fight as long as I have the permission of a hero. Please, let me help. She seemed to be stuck on the question. She kept looking back and forth between him and the gnomus before her eyes widened when they landed on him one last time. You're the winner of the sports festival. I'll take that as a yes. Izuku bolted past the hero, unzipped his jacket, and shifted to Fenrir full form. His first target was the flying gnomu that was currently about to swoop on a down hero. 
he caught it in the dare by the ankle with a clawed hand. He pulled back his arm and swung it down into the concrete hard enough for it to be embedded into it. He hoped that it would keep it there long enough to deal with the bigger one. He looked to see that it was currently raising a fist to bash in a hero's head. Orange sparks shrouded the wolf as it flew. The hero was confused, but thankful as the beast that was just about to kill him seemed to vanish. Then, they all heard the boom as the gnome was thrown into a bus that blew up on impact. Everyone turned to see the ominous silhouette of a werewolf standing in front of the mass explosion. The people who watched the wolf take out the massive creature were impressed while the ones who also watched it take out the winged one were amazed. They weren't able to relax, however, as the larger gnome charged the wolf from the flames. The two met in a thunderous impact that sent a shockwave. Their hands were interlocked, but not for long as the wolf opened its mouth and smoke cannon was released. The villain was sent back to the bus with much more force than the earlier attack. Assuming that the gnomes were dealt with, because the winged one never got up, the wolf ran off faster than anyone could see. After all, he picked up the scent of two people he needs to find. So be it. Die. For Tensei. Stain dodged over the kick and gave one his own with a spiked boot to eat his shoulder. With the other foot, he kicked down into his head. There was no mercy as he stabbed a blade into his arm. Gah. You say that you'll live up to your brother's name, and so far, you're doing a good job at it. You're even in the same position he was before I ended his career. Instead of like a true hero, you ignored the other fake and instead used your power for your own selfish gain. It's people just like that are the reason I kill. Stain raised his blade to end the boy's life and brought it down. The sword changed trajectory when it blocked a spear of ice that nearly impaled him from down the ally. He looked at the attacker and saw a dual-color-haired girl riding a large wolf. And both were approaching fast. Get away from them! The girl threw another spear that met the same blade as before. The hero killer jumped away when a blast of smoke came from the wolf's mouth. The two took the spot that Stain was in previously, with the wolf standing protectively above Ida. The girl hopped off the side and took a stance. Great, just what I needed, more reinforcements. I don't know who you two are, but it would be best if we didn't take the time to figure that out. Leave. Midoriya, Todoroki. What are you doing? Get out of here. This is my fight. Ida was going to continue but was hushed by a growl. The wolf that gave the growl begun to shift into another boy. Shoko, take Ida and the other hero and get out of here. I can take care of Stain. Izuku, are you sure? This isn't just another villain you'll be dealing with. Yes. I need as much room as possible if he ends up being stronger than I thought. If Ida or the other hero is here, they will just be in the way. I'll cover you if he tries to attack. No. Both of you stop. I need to do this. You need to shut it. He was silenced by the wolf again. Going after the hero killer was a stupid move, Ida. I expected better from you. Now go. Shoko grabbed onto the back of his neck guard and the scarf of the hero. With strength that proved she was the number two hero's daughter, she rushed them out of the ally. The entire time, Izuku kept his eyes on the man in front of him. I can't tell if you wanted to fight me alone because you were smart or foolish. Guess it doesn't matter in the end. As soon as I kill you, I'll track down the girl and kill the... Forest fire eyes bore just inches away from Crimson. As if I'd let you get even close. Izuku sidestepped a blade that came close to his hair. The killer brought out another blade and went to stab the chest. The thrust was deflected with large claws that belonged to a wolf's hand. The force of it broke the end of the blade that flew and stuck into the wall. This one is dangerous. I need to get a drop of blood before. Stain's thoughts were cut short as a massive force stuck him in the stomach. The villain was sent further down the ally and collided with a dumpster. RRR, who is this kid? I didn't even see that attack. Stain was able to stand from the trash that covered him and looked to his opponent. Stain. The owner of the name froze. Whatever your goal is, or whatever your reasons may be, taking a human life is an awful thing to do. That's why I hate myself for the day that I took a life of my own. That is why I'm putting a stop to your slaughter. So please, just surrender now. Listen kid, 
I can't stop what I'm doing. These heroes are all fakes, don't you see? That is why I'm doing this. They're not heroes to do what the title means. They're heroes because all they care about is money and fame. They don't care about the people they save. Only do they care if they're getting paid or getting their picture on a wall. I won't stand for it. Stain pulled out two blades from his bandolier and went for the boy. Before the blades could reach him, both of Stain's wrists were grabbed by furred hands. The strength behind the grip wasn't enough for the villain to drop the knives, but the burning on his skin was. I don't like to put people in these kinds of situations, but if you surrender then I'll let go. Stain looked to the wolf. The only feature that showed any emotion was the piercing eyes of forest fire as they seemed to be looking straight into the villain's soul. Izuku was answered when the villain jumped up and extended both his legs in the motion of a dropkick. Just before his feet hit their target, the wolf disappeared. In the split second that he was in midair, Stain was able to find that Izuku had ducked the kick and was now directly underneath him. With a devastating punch to the back, Stain was sent several yards into the air. When he reached his highest point, he began to fall. He planned to grab onto the side of the building and run from the wolf. He knew at this point that he was no match. Trying to take a drop of blood would be like taking a tooth from a dragon. He succeeded by latching onto a window ledge. From here, he could climb up the building and escape. Stain was only able to put one foot against the wall before he was hit by the same smoke attack that the wolf used earlier. The continuous force launched him upwards and onto the roof. The landing on his back was rough, but he was still able to move. What the hell is this kid? I can't get a break before he hits me with something else. Exactly. Stain turned to see the boy standing on the edge of the building. His face was still emotionless except for his eyes. Is the only way for you to surrender is to render you unconscious? Stain did not have any intentions to give up. He only just started. He was not going to let this boy stop him so soon. F fine. I give. Good. Izuka walked to the killer and pulled out some firm string from his pouch. He was just out of arm's reach now. Stain pounced. He had a concealed knife in his hand that was closing in on the greenette's neck. Just as fast as Stain got up, he was back on the ground with an already forming bruise on his forehead. This time, he was down for good. Izuka lowered the fist that he had used to knock out the man. I never knew that people without animal mutation quirks could make my instincts flare like that. I couldn't think of single thing other than to take you out. The only way for me to not rip you apart was to cut off my emotions. Just how dangerous are you? Izuku restrained and disarmed the hero killer. He had just dropped down from the roof with him over his shoulder when he heard an incoming party. Izuku. Further down the road, he could see Shoko at the front of a group of heroes. I brought some pros just in case if things didn't go well, but I guess you've got everything handled. Wait. You didn't tell us that the villain was Stain. One of the heroes was stunned to see that a boy had the S-rank hero killer in his arms. Soon, the others gained the same expression. Thank you, Shoko. What about the Nomis? I was only able to take out two of them before I had to leave, but there was a third one as well. That was you too. What the hell, kid? Please answer the question. I heard from another squad that it was taken out by Endeavor and another unknown hero but the last I saw, the other two were detained. Someone from the group gave Izuku the news before another hero spoke. Hold on, I thought there were four of them. Fear is powerful emotion in its own rights. So powerful that there is only one other thing someone can feel that is stronger. Dread. Everyone's attention was drawn to the distant explosion near the main location of the attack. Here. Take Stain to the police then gather other heroes to help fight. No one was able to object as the boy shifted into a large wolf and the girl sat on top. With high speeds, they made their way to the scene. When Endeavor arrived with Gran Torino, the creatures were already dealt with. After asking another hero, he learned that it was Izuku based off the description. He was prideful that his student was showing his mighty power, but the elder next to him seemed upset about it. Endeavor had helped putting away the Nomis to ensure that things went smoothly. It did not. Years of experience allowed Endeavor to dodge the attack with just a cut on his shoulder instead of full decapitation. 
He gained distance from his attacker and registered the beast in front of him. This Noma was far different than the others. The top half was normal compared to the others. Its fingers were tipped with retractable claws. The same ones that nearly got him in the first attempt. Its neck was longer and had a short snout that resembled a crocodile's. The teeth that were within the snout were much bigger to be a comfortable fit. The most interesting feature about this Noma was its bottom half. Instead of just a single pair of legs, it had two. It looked like a centaur, but with a muscular tiger instead of a horse. The tail was long and thin, and had a shiny needle on the end that looked like it could inject a nasty venom. Overhaul, the thing was massive. It was almost twice the size of the bigger Nomo from earlier. HGR, guess my work isn't done yet. I'll back you up. Torino took a spot next to the flame hero. The three charged. Izuku had four runes and some of OFA activated, but with Shoko on his back, he couldn't go much faster. Even though, they managed to get there in under five minutes. He followed the scent that was the most concentrated. He would be able to find them at the middle. What they did find was awful. Heroes were scattered all over the place. Some were breathing, some weren't. Izuku caught the shape of Endeavor against a wall. From the look of it, he was harshly thrown against it. The most disturbing thing was the small hole he had in his throat that leaked a pink liquid. Each time he breathed, more of it oozed out. It smelled of certain death. Although they both hated the man, it was horrible to witness. Even Shoko looked mortified. But if he was able to hang on long enough, they could get help. Things only got worse when he picked the smell of Torino's blood. It wasn't much, but it was still a bad sign. They passed around a corner of a building and saw his mentor. He was dangling from his ankle. Around it was a long tail that connected to a terrifying monster. The monster had its eyes on the elder as it held it in front of its face. It looked like it was about to eat him. Not going to fucking happen. Izuku let out a booming roar that would have deafened Shoko if she hadn't covered her ears in time. The thing turned its head towards the two. With its attention diverted, it dropped Torino to the ground. Shoko knew that this was something she couldn't handle. This monster was able to defeat her father and tons of other heroes. What she needed to do was get the man out of the way and find others. But that didn't mean she liked leaving Izuku again. You better come back. Was all she said before jumping off and working her way around the freaky centaur. The Nomu took steps that left cracks in the ground as it came to Izuku. When it was just twenty feet away, it gave a cry of its own. It was almost just as loud as his own, if not more. It was screechy and completely unnatural. This is something else. I need to be serious, otherwise I could end up just like the others. The wolf reared up, and the fifth gate opened. There is absolutely no holding back in this fight. The orange turned to purple. I need to take this thing out, right now. He grew to match the size of the Nomu. So, I can protect them. The wolf lit up in a field of purple electricity. I will end you Ragnarok charge the Nomu. Chapter 15, A Step Closer for moments that felt like hours, Lavender eyes bored in empty ones. Neither moved a single inch while the anticipation for the first move kept rising. In the blink of an eye, a needled tail came shooting for the wolf's chest. The tail was caught just before the blade could pierce its target. With a hard yank, the Nomu was brought to Izuku who clutched his other hand around the Noma's throat. He continued the momentum and swung the beast around and against the building. It was best for this fight to end as soon as possible, so he took the chance and went for the head. The wolf was met with a hard kick from the front legs of the Nomu that sent him to the buildings on the opposite side of the street. The crash against the structure was damaging but didn't quite bring it down. Nomu regained its footing and charged the wolf. Thanks to his agility, the attack was dodged to the side. Now, the Nomu had a burly fist dug deep into the wall. Izuka used this opportunity to charge a small percent of OFA into a powerful right hook. The force sent the beast smacking with several buildings down the street and finally came to a stop when it collided with an abandoned fire truck. The Nomus landing placed it behind the vehicle after making it flip from its impact. Ragnarok chased after his opponent but was stopped short when the truck began to raise and saw that it was being lifted by the Nomu. With frighteningly little effort, 
it was thrown with tremendous power as it soared down the street. The wolf simply raised both arms that became empowered by OFA. The connection made a horrible thud as its speed was heavily slowed and caused the wolf to slide backwards several yards. When both stopped, Ragnarok had the truck in his own claws and lifted it above his head. Nomu was rushing towards him again with speed that equaled its strength. Ragnarok turned to where the truck's front was facing the incoming monster. With his own power, the wolf threw the truck like a large spear. Although the velocity behind the vehicle was the same as before, that didn't stop the truck from being knocked away in a single punch as the Nomu maintained its charge. Ragnarok met the Nomu as their hands clashed together that stopped both in their tracks from the opposing force. The shockwave from the collision cracked the ground beneath them and shattered any nearby windows that weren't already broken. Both unstoppable forces pushed on one another before the needled tail went for another move. Too bad the wolf was already one step ahead. Clenched fangs separated to release a smoke cannon that blasted the gnome with straight in the chest. The powerful attack launched the centaur the rest of the way down the street and through a building at the end. Izuku gave chase when the cannon emptied. The gnome was in lying in an opening now, with it on its side. It was inside some sort of small park where it was still healing the barely operational chest cavity. Then, it turned its attention to the hole from where it came from. Through the smoke, glowing lavender eyes glared from the dark building. A dark furred hand with shining purple veins emerged from the darkness and gripped the edge of the broken wall, claws digging into the concrete. Although the gnome couldn't feel fear, the scene would have made anyone else reevaluate their life decisions, hero or villain. The rest of the wolf emerged just as the gnome's chest was regenerated. Ready to fight once more, the monster dashed to its target. It didn't get far before Ragnarok opened its mouth again and the gnome was encased in a tomb of indigo flame. It screeched horrible sounds that no man should have to experience to listen as its body was being scorched by mercilessness fire. The gnome would drop to the ground and was still screeching, but it was getting weaker. Soon, it was pathetic grunts and squeals. Then, silence. The only thing to be heard was the thriving flames as it ate away at the body of the defeated centaur. Izuku's instincts told him to howl for his victory against the opposing apex. Just as he lifted his head, a sharp pain intruded on his leg. Without thinking, he brought down a hand and smashed the unknown attacker. When he saw that the needle tail had finally made a hit, he saw that it looked to be sucking out his blood, instead of injecting the strange liquid. Before he could investigate, he sensed the presence of the Nomu again. He looks up just as the massive fist connects with jaw and sends the wolf across the park and into another building. This time, the impact caused the structure of three stories to come down on him. That mass amounts of weight, including the odd position that he was in, made it difficult for him to get himself out. Above, he could hear the Nomu approaching and starts to pull off the concrete on top. Deciding to not ask questions, Ragnarok waited for the right moment. Chunk after chunk, when Izuku spotted the first sign of the centaur, he blasted another cannon in the spot where he depicted the head to be. The cannon was also able to knock away the rest of the debris as Izuku leaps out and gives a kick to the gnome's chest, making sure to dig in his claws in the process. The ambush pushed the beast back many yards, but was able to keep its footing. After a quick inspection, he could see that the Nomu had managed to dodge the cannon enough for it to only graze its neck and shoulder. Then there was another thing. How is this thing still standing? He burnt this thing to a crisp and made sure that it was dead before he assumed anything. Did sucking out his blood with its tail somehow heal it? If that's the case, then he needs to take care of it. Lucky for him, there's Fire Hydrant next to him. He rips it out of the ground just as the Nomu charges again and foolishly uses its tail as a starting move. He aimed the fire hydrant for the needle to enter the bottom, and when it did, he crushed the metal around the needle, making the weapon useless unless pulled off. Not like he was going to let that happen. The Nomu looked slightly confused about the added addition to the end of its limb until it was given a brutal slash across waist from Ragnarok's claws. It screeched as it brought its attention back to the wolf. Said wolf didn't let up as he slashed down the left side of its chest. The centaur brought an arm to defend against the third attack, but the attempt proved to be a waste as the next strike was OFA charged. With a downward slash, Ragnarok ripped the arm right off and dropped to the ground with it no longer attached to anything. 
The gnomish screeches were starting to get annoying at this point, so the wolf gripped the monster's bottom jaw, brought a foot against the centaur's chest, and pulled. Izuku didn't like the idea of disfiguring people, but this thing was not a person, and his instincts were constantly howling to end this intruding apex. The fleshy sound of the creature's jaw being ripped from the gnome was enough to make anyone lose their lunch, but just looking at it was far worse. Now, the screeches were garbled and were unable to as loud without the use of its bottom jaw that was currently in Azuka's hand. With the final decisions to take out the Nomu in the next move, Ragnarok charged OFA to the max in his right arm. He accumulated a ball of indigo fire in his palm. He seized the head of the Nomu, lifted it high into the air, and brought it down. Hard. If you won't do your job and help me then I'll go myself. Miss, I'm sorry, but with all these people here, we need as many heroes to ST. The first thing to cut the hero off was the intense vibration in the ground that became more violent by the second. Then came the deafening boom of a shockwave. After everyone was able to regain their bearings, Shoko and everyone else there turned to see small plume of a dark cloud of smoke. Just above the buildings, she could see the wave of raging indigo flame. Without hesitation, Shoko took off in the direction of the explosion, ignoring the yells from the heroes behind her. Along the way, she could see the entirety of the destruction that the gnomus caused to the city. Fire was still spreading, the smell of blood lingered in the air, buildings were either damaged or just completely destroyed. Shoko hated seeing the few heroes who weren't able to survive that were lying in a pool of their own blood. She made her way back to the original spot where they confronted the seven-limbed gnomu. It was easy to follow the trail that presented their battle. It also helped that the plume of smoke hadn't dissipated yet. She found herself at the entrance of a large hole going through a building that was somehow still standing. The glow of indigo seeped through the dust and smoke. With caution, she entered. The first thing to notice was the heat, which was obvious. Then, the ground slightly dropped downwards after the exit of the building. The opening that used to be a park was now a small cavity of demolished earth. In the very center, very little smoke still remained. But even then, she could see the glowing outline of Ragnarok. He just stands there with his head looking down as both don't move. Finally, Shoko makes her presence known. Izuku. The voice was just above a whisper but held a sternness behind them. The smoke finally gave way as the wolf turned its gaze to the girl. He looked too unharmed but was breathing heavily. She knew of that effects that using Ragnarok had on him. Since he was only able to recently control it, Using it took too much stamina out of him. And if this Nomu was strong enough to take on as many heroes as it did, then it was surly strong enough to push Izuku to his limits. And if that last attack was able to see from how far she was, then it must have taken a toll. The large wolf slowly made its way to Shoko while simultaneously shrinking down. The horns sunk back inside his body, the fur was replaced by skin, limbs returned back to human shape, and his snout shifted back to that of a boy. By the time he approached Shoko, he was back in his original form. When the glow of his lavender eyes turned back into forest fire, he dropped. Shoko was able to catch him just before he hit the ground, and if it weren't for her slight heat resistance, his skin might have burned her. They lowered themselves to the ground and both sat together. Are you okay? Izuku spoke first, but the words were met with a disbelieving look by the girl. Am I okay? What about you? You were the one who took on a Nomu that was a centaur. Something that definitely should not exist, by the way. Heh, just making sure. Anyway, we need to get out of here and go help the others. Izuku attempted to sit up but was brought back down by a pull on his arm. Hey, what's that about? One, you've already done enough. You single-handedly fought that monstrosity and came out on top. Two. I'm not sure how well people will handle having someone help them that doesn't have any clothes on. At that, Izuku looked over himself to find that he was indeed naked. He blushed slightly as he wrapped his tail around himself. Ah. I forgot to get my costume fitted for Ragnarok transformation. Damn it, that's the third time now. In the end, Izuku was able to conjure a flame that he wrapped around himself. The two walked back through the hole and back to the others. Izuku would be given a blanket by one of the officers to cover up with, and Shoko would go help use her ice to distinguish the fire. 
Back at the final scene of the fight, the gnome's entire upper body was reduced to ashes while the bottom half was charred, but still intact. Intact enough that the tail was nearly untouched with the end of the fire hydrant still attached on the end. With a simple touch, the metal decayed. As usual, Izuku's healing factor worked wonders as he was released the next morning. He got to work immediately as he assisted in the cleanup of Hosu. During this, people would thank him for helping out, both with cleaning and fighting the previous night. After hours of finding lost citizens and cleaning up the streets, he retreated for the day. He still had some things to do after all. Knock, knock. The response to his presence at the door was long but was finally received by an unwelcoming voice. Come in. Izuku opened the door to see Ida sitting up on the hospital bed. The moment Blue Eyes landed on the greenette, they turned sourer than before. Then scent of hostility was needless as Izuku could feel the burning in the boy's gaze. Ah, uh, hey Ida. I was just coming over to make sure that you were doing ALR. I thought I could count you as my friend. The statement threw Izuku for a loop. Did he really just say that? What does that mean? If you had any idea of what I was feeling you would wouldn't have interfered. He was mine to fight, and mine alone. Ida, I if I had do. No. I don't want to hear it. That sick bastard ended the hero in genium. Now, all that's left is a broken man who can never use his walk another day in his life. He was a great hero, and a better older brother than anyone could ask for. I needed to bring that damn scum to justice for the crimes that he had committed. You had no right to change that. Tenya Ida. The raise in the wolf's voice stopped the other boy from continuing. Do you seriously believe everything that just came out of your mouth? Did you put your heart into those words? If you weren't about to be killed by Stain, would you have broken the law in order to satisfy your want for revenge? Dead silence fell upon the room as both looked into each other's eyes. Ida looked somewhat unsteady from Azuku's comeback. Then the look of bad focus returned. Yes. For my brother. Izuku closed his eyes and shook his head in disappointment. He turned back to the door and just before he walked out, he looked back to the misguided boy. Not only would your brother disapprove of your actions, but Stain was right. Ida's flinched at the first sentence and for the anticipation of the next. You're no hero. Izuku walked out. The wolf was no longer in the same good mood from this morning of helping out the people in Hosu. Not only had he lost the trust of Ida, but now he was sure that the blue-haired boy wasn't finished. And the day just kept getting better, because Endeavor has called him into another hospital room. The number two hero was able to survive the lethal liquid, mostly due to the fact that his large body and quirk made it difficult for the venom to spread. But he wasn't the only one to have been injected. Others weren't as lucky. He was just a few doors away from the room when got the scent of Shoko. Unless Endeavor called her here too, I'm surprised that she's in the same room as him. Knock, knock. Come in his voice sounded more rasped and strained, which made sense because of the injury. He opened the door to see the large man sitting up in his bed with bandages around his throat. Since he was out of hero costume, his flaming appearance was reduced to small licks of fire on his face. Shoko was sitting in a chair in the farthest corner of the room. Guess he did call her here. Hello, sir. You called for me? Izuku closed the door and took his own seat. Yes. I wanted to congratulate the both of you for exquisitely handling the attack on Hosu. I taught the both of you well. Get over yourself. Is that all, sir? Izuku didn't really want to be in here much as the girl behind him. If he could get this over with, then they two of them could leave. Not yet. The two of you are going to be interviewed. As it is right now, a pair of UA students acted like pros in the face of true danger. Endeavor looked to Shoko. One rescued several people from the devastation of the Nomu's rampage, including saving a pro hero and another UA student from the hero killer. Then looked to Izuku. The other single-handedly took out three Nomus, one of which killed several pros and nearly me. So, it was inevitable that the people would want to find out more about these prodigy students. Both teens were surprised to hear this. People wanted to put them in front of cameras that would be broadcasted throughout all of Japan. Sure, the same thing happened in the sports festival, but this was specifically for them. Um, Endeavor. Is that a good idea? 
exposing us to the people that we did this even though we broke no laws could have some complications. Any complications will become null when the both of you are put in the spotlight. You will be seen as future pros, and hardly anyone could argue. This interview could ensure that you will become high-ranked when you go pro. Izuku wasn't sure how to go about this, and when he looked back to Shoko, he could see that she didn't know either. But that was when he realized something. We don't really have a choice, do we? He was answered with a smug smile. Great. The couple left the hospital after Endeavor basically forced them to agree that they would go for the interview. They didn't make it ten feet before Izuku had to spin around and catch the incoming foot. Damn it, kid. I told you to stay on the damn train. I know you're Tashinori's boy, but that doesn't mean you can just go around fighting villains. Gran Torino didn't waste any time to verbally attack the boy when his physical one didn't work. With a nervous laugh, Izuku went to respond. Well, it's good to see that you're recovering quiet well. Pfft. As if that monster could seriously hurt me. You were groaning the entire time I carried you. Shoko caught the retired hero in the lie. Torino's reaction of a betrayed look made Izuku burst into laughter. A.H., both of you zip it. You're lucky that neither of you broke any laws otherwise you really would be in trouble. After his fit of giggling, Izuku spoke again. We're truly sorry, sir, but I will say that I would gladly do it again any time. People were in serious danger. We couldn't have just sat back and done nothing. Mmm, I hate to agree with you on something like this. But, if you hadn't jumped in when you did, there would have been too many casualties to call this a victory. Now, be sure to stop by my place to pick up your stuff. After that, you're free to head back to UA. What about you, Torino? Izuku asked with curiosity of what the hero planned next. I need to go pay a friend of mine an overdue visit. With that, he turned and walked away. After a few seconds of Izuku watching the man leave with an afraid expression, Shoko stated her confusion. Why do you look like you know what he's talking about? He's talking about Dad. Oh. Oh, oh indeed. Sunday. I can't believe that he's making us do this. Izuku couldn't help but agree with Shoko. Endeavor decided to hold the interview on the day just before the first day of school back from internships. At least he wasn't dumb enough to have it on a school day. But, at the same time, it was just days after the incident. Couldn't he have waited for more people to recover? He's barely walking around himself. Before he could respond, they heard themselves be called onto the stage. They made their way from the back rooms and into the camera's view. The audience cheered and whistled for the two, or they would have if they were real. The voices were just recordings. They took their seats across from the man that would be speaking with them about what happened in Hosu. His name was Matsuda Terezo. However, his name nor the shows was familiar to either of them. Which really threw off Izuku, since he knew almost every TV program when it came to the news that had anything hero-related. Hello, hello. How are our heroes of the future doing on this fine day? The man was cheery, as any interview for a TV show should be. But that didn't stop them from thinking that it was not a fine day when people were having life problems in the remains of Hosu. But, for the sake of not causing any unnecessary complications, they played along. I think that we are doing quite well, Terezo. How about yourself? Izuku asked the question. Well, I'm feeling pretty good myself. I have the opportunity to have the both of you here on my show. Now, I just want to go ahead and say this. This is extraordinary. We have two very well-known individuals here. One is the daughter of Endeavor, the number two hero. And the other is well-known for a few different occurrences. The first is from four years ago, actually in a nearby mall. Midoriya, can you explain that? Great. Of course, he would bring that up. Although, this could be a good opportunity to change some people's views on me. Yes, I can actually. If you're able to connect me with an older four-year-old video, then you must know the story behind it, right? From what I have been able to figure out, it was a sort of hostage situation that had your mother at gunpoint, correct? Izuku didn't like to bring up the memory, but he didn't have a choice now. That is correct. While my mother and I were shopping, she was secretly held at gunpoint by a villain from behind. I was able to attack the villain before his demands could be met. 
However, things didn't go exactly as planned, and my mother ended up getting hurt. His answer was met with a choir of sad noises from behind the camera. I am so sorry for what happened, but I'm sure that you were thrilled to hear that she was going to make it. Speaking of the villain, I was able to get added information not too long ago saying that the villain had a type of shield quirk that allowed him to temporarily dull any damage. So that's how the bastard wasn't knocked out from crashing into the stand. Well, that makes sense. I'm sure that you've seen the video and watched the news, so there is no need for me to continue. What about the transformation that you took? In the video, you threw the symbol of peace like it was nothing. Yeah, that. My quirk comes with a lot of aspects that I feel would take too long to explain. But that was the first time that I've ever taken that form, so I had no control over myself. And that's completely understandable, Midoriya. I would have felt the same way if something like that happened to me. Then, for years later, you show up again to save, not just one, but three fellow junior high students from the sludge villain that was eerily similar to the same hostage situation as the one regarding your mother. I think we can all agree that you did a remarkable job in taking out the bad guy, despite that the heroes who were supposed to be doing that, sat back and did nothing. Sure, throwing those heroes under the bus. Bakugo, I really hope you're watching this next part. It was a frightening moment to say the least. Especially since one of them used to be a great friend of mine. I was hoping that after the incident we could become friends again, but he thought otherwise. He could see Shoko give him a confused look from the side but didn't acknowledge it. So, it was personal again, I see. Even then, you fought with such skill that it looked like that you were a very experienced pro. But that would make sense if you're trained by a pro hero for four years. Okay, there's definitely something up. Iring never announced that she has taken someone under her guidance. You yeah. It was a huge help to expand my skills. It was mainly due to control my quirk. But there was plenty of time to include basic hero training. Very helpful indeed. Anyway, back to the present. For a while now, the both of you have been making names for yourselves in the school UA. You two were able to wipe the floor with the robots within the entrance exam and archive the highest scores in years. Not only that, but be the only ones to take out the zero PS in decades. How does he know that? Any information regarding the entrance exam is kept hidden in the school. Shoko took care of this question. I'm not sure how you were able to obtain that information, but yes, that is correct. The reasoning behind our actions were to save the other contestants from having their chances being tarnished. And that you did, Todoroki. It's the essence of a hero to put others before themselves. It's an honorable and noble act that people need to look up to. He said, seemingly ignoring the first part of Shoko's answer. Now, what about the USJ? Todoroki saves the multiple lives of her classmates while Midoriya defended them from a nomu, much like the ones from yesterday. Have anything to say about that? How? He couldn't have gotten that information from other news because even they didn't know. Izuka managed with this one. Why yes. They had devised a plan to somehow infiltrate USJ. They had done so with precise actions and knowledge. But, after the security changes following the attack, it will not happen again. They needed to choose their words carefully. Something's not right here. A very scary situation indeed. But those villains sure didn't know what hit him, huh? They tried to attack a class of powerful students then attend the number one hero school. Not sure what they were thinking. But now, I'm sure it's oh man, we sure did make a mistake here, oh no dot. The joke was awful as Terezo imitated a villain's act with goofy movements. But, despite everything that you two have done so far, I think your greatest accomplishment was the horrible battle of the Nomu invasion that took place in Hosa late last night. The heroes were dropping left and right. Everything was being obliterated, no one was safe. And then you showed up. The two of you grabbed this threat by the ass and told it to back off. Much like the USJ incident, Todoroki saved lives. But, not just a few classmates, but dozens of strangers. A feat that is hard for pros with double the years on the job. Todoroki, do you have anything to say to the people who are watching that you may have saved? Shoko was caught off guard with the question but was able to deliver. With a small smile and a wave, she turned to the camera. Hello everyone, I hope that you're all doing okay, 
and that I managed to help you in any way I could. That was very lovely, Todoroki, very lovely. Now, the same goes for you, Midoriya. You took on three of the four Nomas that appeared last night. That is incredible. Based on the results from the USJ, these Nomu are very powerful and just as dangerous. Then the most astounding thing is you fought and won against the infamous hero killer, Stain. How did you do it? Actually, besides the Centaur, they were rather weak compared to the first Nomu that attacked USJ. But that doesn't mean that they weren't capable of causing mass destruction, which is apparent in the current state that Hosu is in. Fighting Stain was a different story. I had suspected that he needed to cut someone in order to use his quirk. So, all I had to do was keep that from happening and it was basically fighting someone quirkless. Either way, it was the many years of training that we did. Without it, the outcome would have been far worse. Ah uh, yes, the centaur. Evil thing, wasn't it? The combination of its massive power with a size that matches. It must have been troublesome dealing with that tail, huh? Izuku couldn't answer. He felt it. The way he said it was just like the time he spoke with Shinso at the sports festival. He could scent the small amount of fear come from Shoko. She knew something was wrong as well. This was a trap. They needed to get out. But how? Just then, Izuku felt his phone vibrate in his pocket. He fished it out and saw that Toshi had texted him. He looked back to Terezo and gave an apologetic look before quickly reading it. Equals 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 Dad, do not answer that. He shouldn't know us and why of this. Make Yautso look panicked and five and excise saying that there was Z an accident at home. Guy out OD there. Equals 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 The message from Toshi was barely legible, which only added to the effect that they were in danger. The panicked look he adapted wasn't entirely fake as he feared for his and Shoko's lives. He looked back up to Terezo before giving the excuse. Uh, sorry, sir. But I just got some news that something's happened at home. I'm terribly sorry. No, no, that's okay. Family is important. We will just continue on with Todoroki here. Said girl looked extremely tense, to the train eye anyway. No. Both looked to the boy. Shoko looked hopeful while the man had a foreign expression. It was requested that she should join me. Private matters. The so-called interviewer said nothing and looked Izuku straight in the eye for several moments. The air felt heavier than before and the tension showed no signs of stopping. Until, it did. Oh, well that's a real shame. Too bad this meetup had to be cut short, but it was fun while it lasted. So long you two and good luck on your paths to becoming great heroes. Neither wasted a second as Izuku took Shoko's hand and both quickly walked off the stage. They maneuvered through the rooms until they found the exit. Without thinking twice, Izuku kicked open the door and shifted into Fenrir, his clothes be damned. He knew that it was odd that he was only able to send just a few other people within that building, and that it was just the two of them, but this was something else. Shoko hopped on his back and both sped away from the potential danger towards UA. It took a lot for Izuku to feel genuine fear, but the feeling of being watched from the building behind him made him shiver to his core. That night, the building was searched, but nothing was found. It was as if they never existed, or that they even had the interview just hours ago. Izuku's parents were watching the show when he told them about it. Although Toshi showed slight suspension the moment the man asked the first question. When things seemed to be taking a dark turn, he quickly typed and sent a message that he was forever thankful when he saw his son look at it on the screen in front of them. But it was almost replaced with fear as the man looked ready to attack his son right then and there. 
Their emotions were a constant roller coaster as the man finally let them go and both teens walked off the stage. Anticipation came once more when the man looked back to the camera for several exhausting seconds. Then, he filled a handful of people, including Toshi, with dread as the next sentence came out his mouth. All for one lives. The channel died. Things were definitely different on the first of school back from internships. Although, it was the sight of Bakugo's combed hair from further down the hall that got Siro and Kurashima laughing. Shut up, you damn extras. Otherwise, I'm coming over there that only made everyone laugh more. Ha. Dude, you look like a fancy Pomeranian. Ha ha. Kurashima and Siro were having the best time making fun of the boy's hair. Didn't you hear me? I said shut it. This time, Bakugo's hair puffed back out to its original state, which just kept the laughter coming. This finally tempted the blonde to charge the two, but just before he could reach them, they closed the door to 1A on his face. The two boys enjoyed hearing the sound of Bakugo's nose smashing against wood. For a few minutes, everyone talked about their experiences within the one week that they were under the guidance of pro heroes. Some even got to do some hero work like Tsu and Jiro. Meanwhile, Yurarika was scaring some of the nearby classmates with her intense concentration. What about you, Manoma? How did yours go? Ojiro stated his curiosity to the boy who in turn with Gang Orca. I'll just say that I was fully reminded why he is the number number 12 hero. We didn't do any hero work that I was involved in, but he taught me many things. It didn't take long before everyone's attention was set Ida, who was sitting silently in his seat. Hey, Ida. I heard that you got caught up in Hosu. You all right, man? Kaminari was the first to address the boy. Ida did not move, but the expression on his face seemed to darken. Yes, I am perfectly fine. Now, if you'll excuse me, I would like to be alone. Everyone was hesitant, while others seemed to get the message and backed off. Their attention was placed on the sound of the door as it opened. Standing at the entrance was Shoko who was followed by Izuku. When the two entered, that stared back to every pair of eyes on them. Shoko was the first to address the odd behavior. Um, good morning. Almost the entire class erupted into excited cheers and hollers. The pair was able to make out the occasional congratulations or good job as they surrounded the two. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Everyone, calm down. They thankfully listened the wolf's demand. I'm assuming you all saw the news last night. Yeah, man. The way you took out those gnomes was so manly. Kurashima was as pumped up as usual. I thought it was amazing when I heard how many people you saved, Todoroki. Yurarika had halted her changed personality and admired the peppermint-haired girl for rescuing all those citizens. Dude, did you really take out the hero killer by yourself? Before Zuku could answer Siro's question, he looked to Ida. Why does he have to look at me like that? Izuku went to answer, but this time, was interrupted by Aizawa coming through the door. Take your seats, everyone. We finally got someone exchanged from Class 1B, so she will be introducing herself shortly. Although, I'm sure that a few of you have already met her. There were some excited glances among the class before Aizawa called to the person. You can come in now. At that, a girl walked in through the door. So, that's what he meant. Hello, everyone. I am Ibra Shiyazaki. I believe that I met some of you from the sports festival. She was the girl who took Kaminari out in the first round. Makes sense that she would be chosen. Speaking of Kaminari. Oh, yeah. I remember you. You know, even after what happened, my offer for a date still stands. Oh, good lord. The day passed on like any regular day until it was time for hero basic training. Welcome back, everyone. It feels like it's been too long since I've seen all your faces. Well, it's time to put on your game faces, because today we are having a race. The goal of this race is to rescue the person that is placed in the middle of the this intricate labyrinth that you see before you. The reason I say race is because you will competing in groups of fives. The first to reach me wins. All right, let's begin. The first five to go were Ojiro, Siro, Ida, Ashido, and Izuku. All five went to their spots and took positions. Izuku wasn't as lucky as he was the first time when getting his costume back as quickly as before. 
So, he was back to using his gym uniform. Not that it mattered. So, who do you guys think will win? Kaminari looked the majority of the class who looked back. Did the internship make you dumber? Jiro was always the one to put the electric user down. I think it's pretty obvious that Midoriya has this in the bag. He destroyed all the agility-based tests in the Quark assessment test, so I'm sure he'll be the one to win. Kurashima spoke for everyone there as they watched the countdown hit zero. By now, Izuku has already shifted into Fenrir full form, but didn't move when the signal was given. Wait, what is he doing? Sato was just as confused as everyone else. Just watch. Everyone turned to Shoko then back to the screen to see that the wolf was now crouching low. For a second, nothing happened. Then, the entire class except Shoko jumped slightly as Izuku burst with orange sparks. With a single movement, the wolf was gone. And in its place was a shockwave that dented the metal of where he once stood. It took them several seconds to find the boy until Shoji pointed him out on the screen. Holy crap! Are you kidding me? Kaminari was just as shocked as everyone else to see that Izuku had to be at least 100 feet in the air and was already halfway to their destination. How the hell is he going to land? Watch. They were silenced again by Shoko who just had a smile on her face. Izuku was now falling and closing in on All Might. Said Hiro looked to have no idea of the incoming furry missile until he felt the whole tower he was standing on shake violently as he heard a loud bang. Wah! What the? Who? Where? What? Before he could continue with his confusion, he heard a second noise of something piercing metal. He turned to see two sets of clawed fingers on the edge of the tower. Not a moment later, a wolf head peeped over, giving a wolfish grin. Or at least trying to anyway. Um, you saved me? How did you know where to land? And how to land? When Group 1 got back from the exercise, everyone was eager to ask how Izuku was able to pull off the stunt. I memorized the path that I took from the starting point. Plus, I had D All Might sent, so that made it easier. Everyone accepted the answer, and thankfully, no one caught his near slip up. The next group to go had Ajui, Shoji, Tokoyami, Monoma, and the new girl, Shiazaki. Izuku took notice to the near hidden movements of Monoma making secret contact with Siro, Shoko, Tsu, and Ida when their backs were turned. Because of the uniqueness of his quirk, Izuku had asked Monoma about it. Turns out, he's able to copy up to three quirks at a time and hold them for five minutes. However, he can only use one at a time. What didn't make sense was Monoma touched four people. Well, this is going to be interesting. Interesting it was. From the start, Monoma used Shoko's ice to create a massive ramp that shot across several buildings. Then, he must have used Ida's speed to zoom across the smooth glacier. He didn't stop, even when the edge came closer. And to everyone's surprise, he jumped. The moment he took his last step, Izuku saw the sudden change in his appearance that resembled Ajui's frog quirk. Using the momentum of his previous speed and the powerful jump, Monoma rocketed off the ramp. He flew for several seconds before the frog properties disappeared and his elbows began to morph. Just as he suspected, the blonde shot tape from them and swung throughout the city. He would repeat the process. Whenever he wasn't able to land on the surface of a building, he would activate Tsu's frog quirk again and scale back to the top. Izuku was very impressed with the quick thinking of his strategy and utility of using each quirk to their full advantage. He's used Tsu's quirk multiple times to be more than familiar with it. There were plenty of times that he saw firsthand how Shoko's and Siro's quirks work. And Ida's speed was simple enough to learn. Very interesting indeed. But why didn't he try to copy my quirk? It was a no-sweat that Shoko easily took first place by launching herself over buildings with pillars of ice. Her competitors didn't exactly have the best mobility quirks. Yurarika did decent using her zero-gravity quirk. But Kaminari and Kurashima had no way of using their quirks to their advantage in this race. Aoyama had tried to use his laser a majority of the way but seemed to quickly drop the idea when he looked like he was about to hurl. The exercise was over now and everyone was packing their things to head back to the dorms. All except Izuku who was pulled aside by Toshi. He had said that he wanted to speak him Izuku about important matters that regarded OFA. 
So, here he was, in the empty teacher's lounge with Toshi sitting across of him. Izuku, after some encouragement dash dot. Asterisk flashback to Gran Torino bursting through his front door. Use your imagination however you like asterisk. I have decided that it is time that I told you about the origin of one for all. The origin? You said something like it being a sacred torch, right? Mmm, truth be told, it's not as sacred as you may think, for one for all has a dark birthplace. What do you mean? Izuku, do you remember what the man said after you and Shoko left the stage? I'm sure that you were able to hear it. Izuku frowned at the mention of yesterday's events. The whole thing was stunk of ulterior motives. Turned out, the channel was much more secluded than he realized, so hardly anyone was able to see what went down. But yes, he did hear. All for one lives. Izuku repeated the exact words that he heard the man say as they fled the building. He also saw the man in front of him shiver at the words. Dad, it disturbs me that whoever this is has such a similar name to one for all. Is that why you called me here? Yes. Let me tell you the story of two brothers. The rising of all for one and one for all. Izuku lay in his bed, thinking about the bomb of information that Toshi had told him. It was a tragic and impactful story that hasn't left his mind ever since it made itself at home. That night, he dreamt about all for one as an evil entity. Someone who wanted, and probably could annihilate everything in his path. He dreamt about having to kill the man, or he would wreak chaos upon the world. Then everyone would blame him for being too weak for not being able to defeat the evil with that quirk that was cultivated to do just that. He would be a failure to them all. And when he was at his lowest, all for one would take his quirk and use Ragnarok to eat the world. Izuku was glad that he could go longer periods of time without sleep. Because he wouldn't be getting any more for the rest of the night. It's getting close to summer vacation. But that doesn't mean you can take it easy for an entire month. Which means... The whole class waited with anticipation for what the next words that would be coming out of their teacher's mouth. You'll be training while camping in the woods. Similar to the news of their first hero training, the class burst into excitement. Everyone began to give their ideas of the fun activities that they could have during the entire month. Even Shoko looked excited about the idea, but Izuku was having a little less enthusiasm than everyone else. However, silence followed. Those that are not able to pass the final exam at the end of the semester will not be allowed to attend, and instead will be enlisted in summer school. This time, the class began to encourage each other, wishing good luck and such. Izuku was sure that he was set when it came to the practical, but that didn't mean he would slack off on his training one bit. He and Shoko tested each other when it came to written exams, so he was set on that. He was certain that he could pass. They all had only one week before the final exams begun. One week was more than enough. Tell me, doctor, how is it coming along? Much better than I initially thought. At this rate, it will be ready in just a week's time. Good. Let me know of any more progress of the wolf. Yes, sensei. The doctor returned back to the lab that held dozens of experiments, all of which were inside large clear containers that held a gnome within them. Each one had different shapes and sizes, but all of them looked just as dangerous as the last. All except for one. In the very middle, there was a container that was much larger than the rest. Inside was a beast that was covered in crimson fur and had long muscular limbs that ended with horrid claws. Its furred tail wrapped itself as its teeth were bared. Between its long pointed ears was an exposed brain. The monster opened its eyes to reveal pits of black with glowing slitted pupils. Chapter 16 and 17, At Every Corner By the way, what was with that weird show you guys were on last night? The question from Ashido caught the couple completely off guard. Crap, we were hoping that no one saw that interview and asked questions. Shoko was able to come up with a lie, however. It was a false news interview. Just something that some unknown organization put together to get exclusive information. They just covered it up as an interview. That actually wasn't far from the truth, so it would be hard to tell otherwise. Really? It looked rather suspicious, especially towards the end. The raven stated from across the table. Damn it, Tokoyami must have seen it too. It sounded like they were trying to get information out of you too, much more that they needed. 
Shoji had sent a few seats over. What the hell? Did everyone watch it? I thought it was a hidden channel. What are you guys talking about? Yuraraka didn't have a clue as to what everyone was talking about. Oh, it was nothing you need to worry about. It would be better off just being forgotten. Thankfully, everyone accepted Izuku's request and the topic was changed to the upcoming exam. So, what do you guys think will be on the exam? Rib bit. Tsu asked the question that everyone was thinking. I'm not sure. Aizawa Sensei has only told us that it was a recap of everything we've done over the semester, and nothing more. Yayorosa gave the same information from the words of their teacher. You know, we could just find out ourselves. Everyone's attention was now on Shoko. What does that mean? Yuraraka was confused yet intrigued. It's a stretch, but I believe that the exam had already started. Everyone at the table went wide-eyed at the possibility. In a fight, you must always go in with a plan. So, that's what we have to do. And, to make a plane, we need info. They might be testing us on how well we are able to learn about the enemy before they strike. Yes. That makes sense. We need to everyone to work together for this operation. Yayorosa seemed delighted with the idea and was already giving ideas. Wo Todoroki, way to go. Jiro along with a few others thanked Shoko for the possibility of giving them an edge. Okay. I got it. You know, calling this a master plan is a lot more simple than what you're calling it. Jiro was once again nagging on the electric blonde shenanigans from her place against the wall with her jacks plugged into the room door. What? Just because it's super easy doesn't mean it's not exciting. Kaminari made his comeback. I agree, I feel like I'm a super spy stealing from a super villain. Ashido couldn't control her excited giggling. But you're not doing anything. Sato was the one to take the fun from the pink girl. How's it going over there, Yayorozu? Izuku asked from his position next to Jiro, listening for any footsteps. The girl in question was currently behind Aizawa's desk, using lockpicks that she created to pick the locks on the file cabinets. I don't encourage the idea of stealing, but if this is a part of the test, then I'm willing to give it my all, done. There was a resounding click as the lock to the desk was opened. Yayorosa stepped back to let Shoji scan through the several folders and papers. MMM, regular assignments, future homework, old schedule, MMM. Ranked list of problem children. Results of sports festival, Kaminari you got an F on the last test. Don't tell everyone that. Does this happen on a regular basis in this class? Shiyazaki wasn't in class 1A a week and the whole class is reading through the teacher's desk. I can assure you that this is not the norm. Ida still isolated himself from others but decided to answer the worried girl since everyone else was occupied. Hmm, entrance exam results. A love letter. From Ms. Joke. The class was about to erupt when Hagakir snatched a folder form inside the cabinet. Here it is. The floating folder, next to the floating clothes, spun around to reveal a tag that read final exam. Yayorozu took and opened the folder to reveal two separate categories one for the written exam and the other for the practical. The girl snapped multiple pictures of the papers for the practical with her phone, before handing them back to Hagakure. The invisible girl packed the folder back into its original spot, along with the love letter that was still in the shocked hands of Shoji. Everyone ran back to their seats just as Izuku and Jiro gave the signal of someone approaching. Many tense moments later, Aizawa walked in with his usual gloomy look. Good morning, class. The operation was complete. They had the intel. Good morning indeed. Later that day in the UE dorms. You've got to be kidding me. I thought this was supposed to be easy. Obviously, Ashido and a few others were distraught about the news of how the practical exam was to be done. They had to fight teachers. The same teachers that had years of experience being pro-heroes. Izuku was letting the information sink in, thinking of any possible hidden angles behind the exam. They're having us fight staff members. Other people. The difference in possibilities and reactions from us has a massive gap between the results of both exams. Then that means they aren't just testing out fighting abilities, they're testing us themselves to make us use the given knowledge that we've learned throughout the semester. Which also means, 
Just like in the entrance exam, there are hidden ways to pass or get points. Whoa, this must really have you worked up. You haven't mumbled like that in a long time. Izuku jumped slightly when Shoko had made him realize that he was saying that out loud. He looked up to see the entire class looking at him with stunned expressions. But what he said is right. We can't just expect to let loose our quirks and pass like we did in the entrance exam. We have to prepare for fighting experienced fighters. How do you suggest we do that? Yurarika still looked worried, but hopeful. Simple. We're fighting pro heroes. They're famous for a reason. We'll watch and study previous news videos of them combating villains. This is just another step in getting to know our enemy. Shoko's miniature speech brought inspiration to the class of 1A. They could do this. Good, you're all here. And, you all passed the written part, congrats. But, you're only halfway there, so don't let up. I'm sure that you all gathered information on how the practical exam would work in some way. Anyone have any guesses? The class exchanged looks to each other with determined faces before someone took a step forward. The teachers watched as a wolf-eared boy raised an arm and pointed a finger straight to them. We'll be fighting you. And we prepared. The heroes were collectively in awe at the fierce determination on, not just Azuku, but the class as a whole. Then tell me, my boy, did you prepare for me? The teens turned to view the tall figure of All Might. Because I am the one who you are facing in this exam. Sure. Aizawa said that he based the pairings on multiple factors. But I can't really think of a reason why they paired us together. Izuku was sitting in a private room to discuss strategy with Shiyazaki. Oh. You am I, I am not SS sure. The vine-haired girl seemed extremely tense. After the teachers explained the rules for the exam, they were told what teams that they were being put in. When Izuku learned that he was paired with a student that wasn't even in class 1A for a week, he suggested that they go make a plan. But something was off with her. He was too focused on coming up with a plan to fight his dad that it was until just know that he could smell the small amount of fear from Shiyazaki. Is she really that nervous about the exam? Izuku had a thought, but he didn't like it. Izuku was sitting at a table along with his partner that he now realized was sitting rather far away. He faked a thoughtful position that had his hand laying out on the table, his sharp black claws completely exposed. He was shocked to see that the girl flinched when they came into view and didn't dare to take her eyes off them, in fear that he might use them. She thinks I'm going to hurt her. Why? I've never shown any kind of hostility towards her or anyone. Hey, Shiyazaki. The girl flinched again, her eyes now making contact with his. Are you okay? She didn't answer. Instead, she stood up with a jolt, knocking down the chair that she was sitting in. Without sparing a second glance, she hurried out the door. All that was left behind was a flipped chair and a mass amount of fear that lingered in the air. Oh, Midoriya. What are you doing here? Izuku entered the examination room to see that Yurarika was there. Including recovery girl who was sitting in a chair. Hi, Yurarika. I was trying to make a strategy with Shiyazaki, but she didn't seem to be feeling well. With me. So, I decided to come down and watch the fights. Make sure that everyone is doing okay. Well, hate to break it to you, but Kurishima and Sato aren't doing too good. The girl pointed to the screen to show that the two were struggling with Cementos. No matter how many walls they smashed, one would just take its place, and both of them were starting to look exhausted. Crap just as I suspected. This fight was made to match up students with teachers that they would have a hard time against. In order to win, you need to be able to work around your weaknesses, otherwise. They both watched as the pair were engulfed with thick cement. When it subsided, they were both laying on the ground, knocked out. You lose. Yurarika finished the sentence with a worrisome look for the two who just failed the exam. It was a tough fight to begin with, but this was the very first match, so they didn't have enough time to strategize. Even though we studied the fighting styles of the teachers, they know more about us than we do them. After a few more exams which resulted in Ida, Ojiro, Tsu, and Tokoyami passing, Shoko and Yayorosa stand on one end of a fake town. Both were awaiting the signal. Are you ready, Yayorozu? Why yes, I think so. Do you have a plan, Todoroki? 
I do, but if you have anything that can contribute, I want to hear it. Shoko turned back to the other girl who had a surprised look. Wait, you want to hear my idea? Why? You just said that you already had one. The black-haired girl was confused to how she could help the other that was so much better than her. Todoroki had proven several times over that she was superior. Why is she asking me for a plan? Yum, because you're smart. She said it like it was the most known fact in the world. And it blew Yayorozu away. What? But I'm not as strong as you, and you've shown that you're way better than I am. Did you forget that you were the one who came up with the plan to get the papers from Aizawa's desk? All I did was give an idea, but it was you who put it into action. The girl seemed to think it over, but before she could respond, the exam begun. Remember, I wish to become a hero pair, so I know the importance of partnership. You are needed. So, what's the plan? Eraser Head was stealthily making his way towards his student's location. He was using every possible clue to track down the pair. It didn't take him long, because he spotted the two standing completely out in the open. However, he couldn't tell which was which. They were wearing cloaks that completely concealed their figures. Side by side, they were slowing walking towards the exit. What are they up to? I can't cancel their quirk if they hide themselves like that. But that also keeps them from seeing me. The hoods over their heads would make it impossible to know if anyone is approaching with sight. So, with the grace of a Black Panther, Eraser Head moved behind the two figures and kept pace about ten feet away. He unfurled his capture scarf and prepared to wrap the both of them together. He made his move. With years of training, the hero commanded the scarf to constrict the pair. The moment the cloth tightened the pair, Aizawa heard the rapid sound of objects dropping. He looked down to see that multiple cylinders dropped from underneath one of the cloaks. They were flashbangs. The hero didn't have time to react before he was blinded by the several flashes of light. Forced to close his eyes, he wouldn't be able to use his quirk. Not like he could anyway. Because, the next thing he knows, he's encased in a mound of ice and feels the pressure of the cuffs wrap around his barely exposed wrist. Team Yayorozu and Todoroki have passed the final. Shoko was happy that they passed, but she was joyful to see the same smile on her partner. Whoa, really? Yeah, the added training from Gang Orca really helped. So, I can hold four quirks now. And for ten minutes. Even though I was able to double my time limit, we still need to do this as fast as possible. All it takes is for midnight to just get close to you and you're done. Siro took in the information, seeming to include it into a possible plan of action for their upcoming exam. What did you have in mind, Monoma? The blonde answered with a smile. Siro was by himself, slowly making his way to the exit. Midnight was of yet to show herself. It was starting to make him anxious. He knew that with the rocky terrain, she could pop out of nowhere at any given moment. However, he knew that Monoma had his back. Took you long enough. Ciro spun to his right to see Midnight just a few feet away, just next to a tall rock. Heh. Look who finally decided to come out. For a hero, you sure do act like a sneak. Midnight looked somewhat annoyed at that last comment. Good, just as planned. And what's that supposed to mean? For someone who wants to be a hero, you sure are rude. And awful at teamwork if you left your partner behind. Oh, I didn't leave anyone behind. The hero suddenly realized that this was a distraction. But, before she could do anything, she was stunned by the massive volts that coursed through her body. After a second of being electrified by an invisible force, it stopped, and she dropped. Ciro brought out the capture cuffs and tossed them over to nobody. Except, the cuffs didn't fall, they were indeed caught by something unseen. The cuffs made there was as they latched over the wrist of the knocked-out hero. Team Ciro and Manoma passed the finals. Woo! Nice one, dude. Thanks, you provided the exact opening I needed to sneak up on midnight. I may have copied Hagakir's quirk, but she still would have been able to hear me. That paired up with Kaminari's quirk, and you make a great stealth weapon. All according to plan. By the way, you still have my watch, correct? Oh, yeah. It's Raiite, here. What does nine seconds mean? What? 
That's the countdown for the quirk from Hagakure. My clothes are back at the beginning. Although Ciro couldn't see it, Manoma had made a mad dash towards that point they came. But it was too late. Everyone in the examination room. While the teens were still watching Ciro talk with himself while looking confused, Izuku's eyes caught the tiniest movement on one of the screens farther down. He looked over to investigate. He wished he hadn't. So far, all the exams have been exciting, although some weren't able to pass. Yuraraka's statement stirred a groan from Kurashima and Sato. The same for Ishido and Kaminari, who lost to Nizu. That stupid piece of paper said that we would be fighting teachers, not the freaking principal. Of course, the pink girl was upset. They had no idea that the white animal would be participating in the exams, so they had not prepared for him. If you think they've been exciting so far, then you'll freak out over the next group. Ciro had joined them in the examination room along with Manoma after their victory. The blonde was rapidly looking around to see if he had any funny looks to himself but sighed in relief when no one paid him any attention. I forgot who was up next. Who is it? Oh, nothing really. Just the wolf boy and vine girl going up against the number one hero in the world. Ciro said it in a way that didn't make it seem exciting at all, but the moment the words left his mouth, everyone in the room began to vibrate with anticipation. That's why he's not here. The group turned to Shoko. He's on the hunt. Okay, this is it. Don't freak out. I can do this. Mama HHH. What the hell am I saying? I can't do this. I may be Alpha and he's in my pack, but that's just because he let me. He's an apex. Izuku was consoling himself as he made his way to the front gate. Luckily, there was no one nearby to hear his panic. His instincts were having a fit at the idea of having to fight such a strong opponent who just happened to be his father. He was not having a good time. It only got worse when he approached the gate to see that Shiyazaki who was already there made sure that he was in her field of vision at all times. Once again, she was giving off fear that just made his instincts even more crazy. She is definitely not helping the situation. Team Midoriya and Shiyazaki. Practical exam. Ready? Go. And just like that, the doors before them opened, and they stepped through. Remind me again why those two were paired. Shiyazaki was in class 1 for just a week, so it couldn't have been due to relationship. Power Loader was watching the exams along with the rest of the teachers in a similar examination room when he asked the question. Aizawa was the first to answer. Actually, it is, partially anyway. Regarding to Azuki Yagi Midoriya, most of his weaknesses were patched up when he gained full control of his Ragnarok form. The only thing left is to have his instincts completely under wraps. He does good most of the time, but they got the best of him when the villains invaded USJ. Aizawa recalled the memory of the wolf leaping down an entire flight of stairs with a feral look in his eyes. We can't exactly do anything about it right now, nor do I think we ever can. It's a natural part of him. Trying to take them away might cause more issues than solutions. It doesn't sound exactly professional, but the reasoning for him going against All Might is to fully test his capabilities. Now, the matchup with Shiyazaki is different story. What do you mean? Aizawa didn't answer, instead, looked to another teacher in the room. Vlad King. The blood hero met the gaze of the underground hero before he spoke. You weren't kidding when you said that he was trouble. Sounds like he's giving you a tough time as well. Aizawa had fully warned Vlad King of the boy, guess he didn't take it seriously. Based on what the reports say about his past, he's doing it again. And now, I have students who are terrified of this kid. Vlad motioned his head to the screen that had a Zuku on it. I was never able to catch him myself, but some of my students did report his behavior. Could one of you two explain to me what the hell you're talking about? Throughout the whole conversation, Power Loader was looking back and forth between the two heroes, trying to understand what they were saying. Katsuki Bakugo and Midoriya have a past. Not a very lovely one either. From the reports that All Might handed to me, Bakugo had turned the whole class against Midoriya simply because he thought of the boy as a villain for his quirk. Vlad King almost growled the last part when mentioning the obvious quirk discrimination. So, what you're saying is... Bakugo did it again with your kids. Power Loader was starting to perceive the situation now. Yes. 
In just a few days that I had 21 students, Bakugo had spread his false story among the class. Shiazaki was the perfect target for this. She holds her religion dear. Upon hearing that there was a demon in Class 1A, she believed him. Now, she's afraid of the boy. I've tried reasoning with the ones that believed his story, but it disturbs me how well that the boy is able to turn the tables. I hate to say it, but if I didn't know the truth, I probably would have believed him myself. Isn't it kind of a bad idea to put them together then? We thought that too, at first. However, if Shiazaki is aiming to be a hero, then she must realize the mistake in believing the words about someone, rather than learning to know the person directly. There are plenty of heroes that have quirks that may not make them look like they're there to protect them. This can easily lead to more mistakes. She must learn this. Does Midoriya know about this? Probably not the whole thing. But his file says that he has a keen sense of smell that can even pick of the scent of fear, so he must have noticed the odd behavior of Shiazaki by this point. And, you're making them go up against All Might. The boy might be able to handle himself, but what about the girl? It's a simple matter of trust. This is a team effort, after all. Neither had said anything ever since the exam started. They slowly made their way to the exit, taking the middle road. If they were going to pass, then they needed to work together. H. Hey, Shiazaki? She didn't answer, but he knew she heard him from the way she tensed. I don't know if I've done anything to offend you in any way, but I would gladly work it out after we pass the exam. She finally looked him in the eyes. They were searching for any deceit or trickery. It may not look like it, but the girl was good at reading people, especially from the way they spoke. Why would you do such horrible things to Bakugo? And not just him, but to the ones who trust you. Izuku recoiled from the question slash accusation. But he soon felt anger from when he realized the reasons behind her behavior towards him. His ear twitched. Shiazaki, that story is both false and way too long to tell right now. I promise I will explain everything after this, but right now we need to take cover. What do yo a h h h? The girl was interrupted when Izuku grabbed her around the waist and pulled her into an ally. Just a moment later, a massive force of wind flew down the street they were previously in. The wind itself was powerful enough to rip the street apart as glass shattered and concrete was broken. After a few moments, the gust subsided. It was silent now, almost anyway. He was here. Shiazaki, stick to the allies and get to the exit. I'll hold off all might. The girl looked troubled for a few seconds before they both heard a voice. Where did you go, heroes? Surely you weren't weak enough to get caught up in that weak punch. A final look from Izuku and Shiazaki finally stood to run in the opposite end of the ally. Izuku took one last long readying sigh. He stood and walked back to the main street. When he came around the corner, he saw the intimidating figure of his father standing halfway in a cloud of his own destruction. So, you finally decided to show yourself, but where's your partner? You can't be foolish enough to think that you can beat me by yourself. He may have been acting, but All Might couldn't bring himself to feel frightened by the look that his son was giving him. He really is going to fight me alone. The boy before him had a cold and predatory expression. His face was emotionless while his eyes looked like war. They were trained on him and showed no sign of easing. Then, much like from earlier, the wolf raised a hand to point at the hero. Are you challenging me? He absolutely serious. His instincts have targeted me as a threat to his dominance. Yes. I am challenging you, young Midoriya. The boy's pointing hand closed into a fist before it glowed. The sheer force from the explosion of smoke was enough to vibrate the ground beneath them. All Might used his arms to shield himself from the flying debris that came from his earlier smash. With each passing second, he could feel the heat rising. Soon, embers of bright lavender swirled around the pillar of smoke. Then, with a single swipe of his hand, Izuku swiped away the particles. There he stood, in Ragnarok light form with arcs of flashing purple electricity. And from what All Might could tell, he still hasn't looked away. In the blink of an eye, both males met with connecting fists. All Might separated his hand quickly before the flames on the wolf's fur could burn him. The larger man brought a heavy left hook that was ducked. The one who dodged, 
shot a straight jab to his gut that was blocked. Over and over, they would send devastating attacks that were never able to fully connect. The only thing that took damage was the surrounding area that was getting even more destroyed from the powerful gusts that the brawl created. Before either of them could realize, they were now standing in a small crater, an arena built from the godly fight of two titans. The entire time, not a single step was taken the moment they made the first punch. Both stood their ground as they delivered attack after attack. All Might's decades of experience was giving him an edge on the young boy, but the boy had actual edges as his claws were beginning to make cuts all over the body of the hero. Plus, his stamina may have been draining faster than usual, but he would still have plenty by the time Shiyazaki passed through the gate, or Toshi's limit was up. All he needed to do was hold him here, to keep him from going after her. Before he exited the ally he had tricked his instincts into thinking that his spot as Alpha was being challenged and that Shiyazaki was in potential danger from the man. So right now, nothing was holding him back. God damn, is he really that strong? Back in the teacher's examination room, Snipe was having a hard time believing what was happening on the screen along with everyone else. He must be. The UA staff looked in Izu. Remember what the League of Villains said about the gnome they brought? It was supposed to be able to kill All Might. And if young Midoriya here was able to defeat it, then it would make sense that he is able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. Well, yeah. But actually seeing the two go at it like this. It's crazy to watch. Midoriya may not be All Might's actual son, but his strength is comparable. The amazement from the gun hero was still evident in his voice. Too bad it has to end so quickly. Everyone looked to the screen that Midnight was pointing to. It displayed Shiyazaki back on the main road and just a couple yards from the gate. The moment she passed, they were announced the winners. A fairly common strategy to have one person to get away while the other stays to make sure that they get out. What she said was true, but the others couldn't help but to laugh slightly. Damn it! Stop looking at my hair! Her usual slick back hair was still puffed out in all directions from the electricity that Manoma used to knock her out. If you don't quit the shit, I'm kicking all our asses, starting with you, Aizawa. Said man who wasn't even laughing gave the flustered hero an offended look. What the hell do you want? Meanwhile, in the student examination room, Jiro wasn't sure what was going on with the teachers in the room next door, but she was sure as hell glad that she wasn't there to find out. Both Yagis may have stopped their destructive clash after hearing the announcement, but neither moved from their spots. Both were breathing heavily and still haven't broken eye contact. Whatever damage that Izuku had managed to obtain was already healed, while Toshi had several small streams of blood coming from random spots on his body. It took almost half a minute for one of them to finally move. Toshi looked to the ground while unclenching his fists. It didn't look like much, but for Izuku, it was the signal for his own victory. He quickly shifted back to his original form and barreled into Toshi, squeezing him into a hug that was quickly returned by the larger male. No matter how long I watch you grow, you still amaze me. And once again, I must say that I am proud of you. Thank you, but it's just an exam. I'm not the only one who passed. And I'm sorry about all the cuts. You don't have to worry about that. I've had worse. The two separated as they looked to each again. Now then, let's head back so that we can get the results. After getting back, Izuku went straight to the examination room to meet up with everyone else. With the final exams complete, he was sure that everyone who passed would be celebrating, while the people who didn't would be celebrating a little less. He would make sure to cheer them up. Just as he went through the door, he was met with a bit of a different sight than he expected. There were some people who were celebrating, yes, but there were some who looked slightly confused. When everyone's focus turned to him, they all had different reactions. Whoa, Midoriya, I knew that you were strong, but I didn't know that you could just go up against the number one hero like that. Yuraraka was the first to speak, while Kurashima came just after. Dude! That fight was so manly. You kicked some serious ass out there. Ashido followed close behind the red-haired teen. After that, most people looked on with excited faces while others gave him the same confused look. Hey, Midoriya. Izuku looked to see that Tsu looked like she had a question to ask. Yet, yeah, Tsu? Are you close with All Might? Because you both seem to be really into that hug. Shiite. 
I completely forgot that these matches were being monitored. How could I forget that? I was watching the rest of the matches. How could I forget my own? It's a damn good thing that I already had an excuse in case something like this happened. He looked over to meet Shoko's gaze for split second to see that she also had a look. Please don't say anything. Oh, that's simple. My dad is a retired hero, so he knows a lot of pros, including All Might. I've gotten the chance to meet him a few times, and we became somewhat close. Just because he said he had an excuse didn't mean it was a good one. Much to his relief, most seemed to believe the short story. Except for Shoko, of course. Looks like I owe her an explanation later. Later that night. After the finals were over, everyone had either stayed to hang out in the commons room or returned to their dorms. Izuku was doing the latter, because Shoko was already waiting for him in his room. Yeah, she's definitely suspicious. He approached his door, then opened it to show the girl sitting on the edge of his bed with her legs crossed and was leaning back with her arms behind for support. She had a look that said, you have nowhere to run. Who is All Might to you? The question was blunt. It reminded him of Tsu's bluntness. H, he's just a friend of the F family. He's just so busy that he's not around very often, so that's why you've never seen him around. As he said this, Shoko eyed his left ear. Throughout the explanation, it gave small twitches. Is it something that you really have to lie to me about? She saw him tense from getting caught in the act. Izuku almost never lied to her, except for the few times that he liked messing with her. But even then, she learned that his left ear would give tiny movements when he didn't tell the truth. You um. I I really can't convince you, can I? Shoko simply answered by raising an eyebrow. Asterisk sigh asterisk all right then. I trust you to know this because I also know that you won't tell anyone. But, just to be sure, do you promise to never repeat a word of this? Shoko straightened up at the serious mood that the wolf put on when he agreed to tell. I promise. With just two words, Izuku walked over to his desk that had everything he needed and more. On top was a set of pictures. He picked up a particular one, one of his new family. Once in hand, he walked over to the poster on his wall. He covered a portion of the picture with his hand to only show the man within and then held it next to the large poster. Shoko knew both figures that she saw before her. One was a lanky man with blonde hair and sapphire eyes, Tashinori Yagi. The other was a poster of a large bulky man that held the title of Symbol of Peace, All Might. She just silently stared at the two pictures, trying to figure out what Izuku was trying to tell her. Then, like a light switch, her eyes widened. How is it that obvious? I know, right? Besides him being skinny, if you were to stick his hair straight up then they look like the exact same person. So, hold on. Your father is the number one hero. Shoko was still fully shocked at the news that she was just presented, but she was able to handle better than others since she had a famous parent of her own. All Might married your mother. Isn't that cool? But mom doesn't know. In fact, neither of us were supposed to know. I was just able to figure it out on my own. Why were you not supposed to know? Oh, the whole this knowledge will bring you great danger stuff like that. But I'm capable of protecting myself, and the same goes for you. It's mom that we're worried about. Izuku was gazing down at the lovely photo of his mom and dad along with himself when he heard the rising giggle. He looked back up to Shoko to see that she was in fact starting to laugh. What's up? HMHM, oh I just think it's funny to think about what kind of face Endeavor would make if he found out who your father is. Until just then, he had never thought of that situation. And to be honest, he couldn't help but to laugh along. The next day. No one's going to summer school. The four students who failed the practical exam collectively burst with joy as the news registered in their minds. Such a twist! exclaimed Kurashima. Thank goodness! Looked like a Shido will ever fun after all. As I already said, no one failed the written. However, for if you weren't able to pass the practical. The practical was designed to allow you to be able to pass as long as you looked at it in the right angle. The training camp is for being able to build up your strength and perfect your abilities, as well as learn to accommodate for your weaknesses. Those who fail will obviously be needing this the most. To not allow you to go is foolish. 
Once again, the four riled up into a joyous celebration that they would be able to attend the training camp in the end. That was until Aizawa opened his mouth once more. But failure is failure. During the camp, you will be pulled from certain activities to be assigned extra work. The four teens looked like they were about cry. This booklet says that we'll be on the trip for a while week. Ciro, along with the rest of the class, were discussing the details of the trip and how to prepare. Guess I need to go get some things. Several people agreed Kaminari. Hey guys, I just had a great idea. Everyone looked to the invisible girl. Since we all have tomorrow off, why don't we go shopping together? The idea did seem good. Soon enough, the class agreed to go on the shopping trip the next day. All right, everyone, why don't we meet back here at three? Sound good. After the class had gotten together, Kurashima had presented his own idea of splitting up in the mall to find their own things. After mostly they all left, it was just Azuku, Shoko, and Yuraraka. The boy of the group turned to address the two girls. So, what do you two have in mind? I'm not too sure what exactly I want. Maybe just the simple stuff? I wanted to go with Tenya, but after his run-in with the hero killer, he's been distant. Izuku felt slightly guilty from the girl's words. Although Ida was the one to put himself in that situation, Izuku still couldn't help the fact that he hurt Ida in a way. Anyway, I'll leave you two be. See ya. After her last words, Yuraraka left the couple to themselves. What about you, Shoko? I made a list of things so I could get this done quickly. We need to drop by my mom's later, remember? Izuku hadn't forgotten about their plans to visit Shoko's mother that day. But first, there was something he had to deal with. You go on ahead. I think I'm going to hang back for a while. She must have noticed the nervous expression he had. Are you alright? Upon the question, she realized where what this place meant to Izuku. This, this is the same mall. She looked over her shoulder to see the clothing store further down. The same one where she saw Izuku's mother get shot on TV. Her own expression turned into one of worry. Izuku, you don't have to be here if you still have bad feelings about this place. Just tell me what you need, and I'll get it for you. Izuku was truly grateful to have this girl, but that wasn't it. No, no. It's okay, nothing's bothering me, I just have something that I need to do. He did his best to try and play it off, but was unsuccessful. The girl came closer as they were just a foot away, her eyes becoming level with his nose. Izuku, if there's anything that you need help with, just tell me. The soft voice that she used what like silk to Izuku's ears. But still, he persisted. I swear, I'm alright. And I always know to count on you. To reassure the girl, he gave her short kiss. After the embrace, she finally looked convinced. I'll see you here in an hour, okay? You bet. After his final words, she turned and disappeared into the crowd. And today was getting to be so good. So, mind explaining what you're doing here? When the last word left his mouth, he spun and caught the hand that smelled of ash by the wrist. The person attached to the hand jerked with surprise but made no attempt to lose Izuku's grasp. The boy was the first to speak. Or do I have to crush your wrist to get you to talk? Tamura Shigaraki. The villain before him was dressed in a dark hoodie with the hood up. Even then, he could still see his face. Sheesh. What happened to that face hand of yours? Did it decay just from you being so damn ugly? If you don't want this face to be that last thing that these people see before they turn to ash, I suggest you act natural. The words were hissed through chapped lips. You're not exactly one to be making demands right now. With a single movement I could hurt you in ways that would be irreversible. Izuku wasn't lying, nor was he joking. If this man had bad intention while being in the same building as Shoko and his friends, then he would make the villain suffer. If you do that, then I'll make sure that your mother doesn't survive the next shot. Although it hurt, Tamura liked the reaction of the boy's hand tightening. That meant he had his attention. The handgun that the villain used was too weak. But I don't think the M98 that's aimed at her head will have much difficulty. This time, he heard a small crack in his wrist. What the hell are you talking about? Now, the boy's eyes were wide and filled with fury for the man that he had in his grasp. A few people had looked with confusion at seeing the odd confrontation. But, 
did little to help as they went on their day. You think I would be dumb enough to come here without any leverage? If you don't comply, then it's bye-bye mama dot. Izuku was disgusted with the wicked smile that the villain had. However, he couldn't risk his mother, not again. Slowly, he let go of his wrist. Good, let's talk. Is that all? Izuku was getting more frustrated with the previous conversation that he and Tamura held. He really was just a man-child. Getting so upset with the news of the hero killer. But it surprised him when the villain asked him how to get himself known. Izuku just spun off some dumb theory that seemed to work for the messy moron. Yes, I am very much pleased with our chat. Now if you'll excuse me, I have some people who need recruited. Izuku didn't like that last part. People want to join the League of Villains? Damn it. Don't follow me, or bad things happen. Tamura got up from the bench and walked away while Izuku didn't move, not yet anyway. Shoko couldn't ease the dreaded feeling that suddenly came upon her after a few minutes into her search. She didn't know how or why, but she knew it had something to do with Izuku. As fast as she could, she hurried back to the spot that she last saw the boy. She doubted that he would be in the same spot, but her hopes were fulfilled when she saw his green hair just a couple yards away, sitting on a bench, with someone else. Both were facing to her left and appeared to be talking. To people who didn't know Izuku, that is. She knew the exact posture he took when he was prepared to fight at a moment's notice. His ears were slightly pulled back, his tail was puffed out, and his shoulders were shifted forwards. Whoever the man was that was sitting next to him was bad news. She couldn't see his face because of the hood, but she was able to spot the few tufts of light blue hair that stuck out. She was just about to approach the two when the unknown figure stood and walked away. Seeing her chance, she rushed to the boy. In the split second that her view of him was obscured by someone passing in front of her, he disappeared. Shoko stopped in her tracks and scanned the area, hoping she could find any trace of him. There was nothing. The only thing that even hinted to the boy's existence was the single indigo ember that gently floated above the bench. Bawa, really? But I was so looking forward to it. You, fine, yeah, yeah, I'm on my way. See you soon. Then man pressed the button on the small communicator to end the call. Guess things went better than planned. The man propped himself up from his prone position while slinging the sniper onto his back that was attached to a strap around his shoulder. Before he left entirely from the rooftop, he looked back to the house that contained his target. He was excited to hear that he had a someone to shoot if things went south for another member. He had the perfect shot too. If events did lead up to him being able to blow a hole in the woman's head, he would have had a heyday seeing the reaction of the blonde man next to her. Perhaps another day I will be seeing you in my crosshairs, madam. Farewell. Yes, farewell. The second voice from behind the man paralyzed the villain with fear. He didn't know how, but he knew that if he moved, he would die. You actually thought you were safe? You thought that you could just threaten my mother can get away with it? And then you can just go back to hiding in your little shithole? The sniper felt blazing hands gently wrap around his neck. There is nowhere you can hide from me. Once again, Izuku found Shoko waiting for him in his dorm. How does she keep getting in here without anyone seeing her? This time, she had fear and worry on her face. The door wasn't open for a second before she crashed into an embrace. They stayed like that for many seconds until the girl jabbed him in the gut. Ooh. What was that for? The blow caused him to back away, allowing him to see her face again. Although it still looked worrisome, there was some obvious frustration in it. Don't ever do that again, you jerk. You start acting all weird, and then you have this strange man next to you, and then you're gone, and, and, what the hell? If Azuka wasn't keen on trying to calm the girl, he would be terrified. It took a lot for her to cuss like that. The intimidation was only enhanced as ice spread across her right side and steam rose from her left. Izuku straightened back up and prepared to speak. It was horrible of me to leave you like that. It makes the even worse because I said that I would come to you for help just before that. I wanted your help, but I also wanted to keep you safe. It sounded selfish, but he couldn't help but feel the shame as he looked away. I'm a part of your pack, aren't I? The question brought Izuku's gaze back to the girl. We hunt together, right? That's what you said. We confront these things at each other's sides. 
If you can't remember your own code, then maybe you're not fit for the role as Alpha. Izuku tensed at the obvious threat in her words. But at the same time, he understood what she meant. To Izuku, she was the second Alpha, his mate. Which meant that she was fully capable of having rule over him as much as he did her. But, since he was the one at fault here, his instincts couldn't argue. He drooped his ears in defeat while his tail hung low. Damn instincts. What will you do? You already said that you wouldn't do it again, but just promise that you include me on these types of things. She knew that he had fully submitted, so there was no point in pushing any further. However, also, because of your disappearance, you missed the meeting with Mom. Because I had to be the one to look after you, I had to call and let her know that we won't be showing. It'll be you who will have to apologize to her the next time we go. The wolf responded with a small nod. Come on. We have stuff to do tomorrow, so we need some sleep. I do anyway. She grabbed hold of his hand and pulled him onto the bed with her. They slept together that night. What's with him? How should I know? Ever since he got here, he's been mumbling all sorts of crap. Guy looks terrified. Both police officers looked back to the villain in the interrogation room. His name was Deadeye. His quirk allowed him the deadliest shot, right next to the gun hero, Snipe. He's been on a spree for a while now, but somehow, they found him on their doorstep with cuts and burn marks. His signature sniper was broken in several pieces. Ever since they first spotted him, he jumped at the slightest movement or sound, constantly mumbling to himself. They weren't able to fully make out what he was saying, but they were able to decipher the occasional demon or monster. Thank you for watching the fifth part of What If Deku Was the Norse God Fenrir. I hope you enjoyed following along on this journey with me. In this video, we saw how Deku managed to train with Gran Torino as the All Might's former teacher. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel for more My Hero Academia and Norse mythology content. Leave a comment down below and let me know what you thought of this part of the series. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next one.